have a, uh, uh, an introductory comment from the uh, Binghamton Political Initiative, which is the organization sponsoring the panel tonight. And I'm just going to read it before I get into the, the format for the evening. In the wake of the recent anti-war march on the Vestal Parkway that resulted in the violent arrests of nine students, the Binghamton Political Initiative is sponsoring this panel discussion tonight entitled The Right to Dissent. As the, Uni as the United States occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan wages on indefinitely, people around the country and around the world continue to exercise their rights to dissent. This panel explores topics such as civil disobedience and protest in the context of the anti-war movement. I'm going to start with my role of introducing people. And I guess I'll start from my far left, your right, um, with Ms. Barry Gewanter. As director of the Central New York chapter of the New York State Civil Liberties Union, Barry Gewanter is the local spokesperson and contact person for the ACLU in the Central New York area. Ms. Gewanter has been actively involved with the ACLU for 10 years. She served as the director of the Central New York chapter from 1996 to 1999 and enthusiastically returned to this position in December 2002. She holds a master's degree in sociology from Washington University in St. Louis and spent several years teaching college level courses in sociology and women's studies. She also tutored members of the Syracuse University football team. Uh, she has been an, an advocate for women's rights, gay rights, and lesbian rights, workplace, he workplace health and safety, solidarity with workers and unions, economic justice, and civil rights and civil liberties. She's particularly proud of her ongoing work with the ACLU to educate the public about the Patriot Act and other government actions that have eroded our civil liberties since 9-11. As a leader of the CNY Bill of Rights defense campaign, she was also instrumental in the passage of a Bill of Rights preservation resolution in the Syracuse Common Council in 2003 and in the Elmira City Council in 2005. Ms. Gawanter also played key roles in the implementation of same-sex domestic partner benefits at Syracuse University and the passage of a living wage law in Syracuse. She's been a particularly effective advocate for the free speech rights of students and lawful protesters. And one last comment, in October 19, uh, 2004, Peace Action of Central New York also gave Ms. Gawanter a Peacemaker Award, its first such award for making peace by advocating for civil liberties. So next over is Grace Ritter. Grace is an activist from Ithaca, New York. She has worked with the School of America's Watch Legal Collective and has extensive first-hand experience dealing with the police in New York City, the District of Columbia, and Ithaca, as well as immigration police and Israeli soldiers. Next over, uh, Daniel Burns. Born in Binghamton, New York, to a large Irish Catholic family, Danny Burns grew up as the 10th of 12 children. Danny's parents took on an early unpopular stance of vocal opposition to the Vietnam War, helping to shape, shape his perspective. Danny worked for 20 years in the film industry. He lives in Ithaca with his wife, Jessica Stewart, and their two sons, Finian and Francis, aged five and three years. Danny belongs to the Ithaca Catholic Worker and has participated in several demonstrations and protests against war that have been organized here locally. Danny traveled to Iraq in November and December of 2003, promoting peace and reconciliation as part of a delegation of the Christian Peacemaker teams. Danny was also part of the St. Patrick's Four action that took place on March 17, 2003, and the two trials that followed. Finally, um, Tarek Abdelazim, who grew up in Binghamton, was actively opposed to the Iraq war prior to the illegal invasion and has remained outspoken ever since. In 2005, Tarek was funded by local organizations to serve as the community progressive advocate to work on anti-war <coughs> education, local media reform, and coalition building within the social justice and peace communities. During that summer, Tarek coordinated a grassroots campaign to successfully lobby Binghamton City Council to pass a resolution calling for the immediate withdrawal of, two, of troops from Iraq. 
During this same time, Tarek worked with the St. Patrick's Four support team and helped organize the Citizens Tribunal on the Iraq War, a five-day educational forum that was held alongside the St. Patrick's Four trial. When progressive candidate Matt Ryan won the mayoral election in November 2005, he made a bold move and appointed Tarek as deputy mayor. Serving the public in this capacity has only strengthened Tarek's opposition to the Iraq War. Earlier this year, he assisted with a grassroots campaign to raise awareness about impeachment. The effort resulted in Binghamton City Council unanimously approving a resolution urging the U.S. Congress to open an impeachment inquiry into President Bush and Vice President Cheney. As deputy mayor, he strongly advocates for sustainable practices, participatory democracy, development policies that advance social and economic justice, and respectful dialogue. So if we could just welcome our panelists, that would be great. And in terms of uh, comments, why don't we start uh, with you, Barry, and then move uh, to our right. Uh, I've been asked to talk about your rights to protest, and to some extent, it has to do with rights and limits. As you probably already know, I am the representative of the ACLU, and we work to protect your rights under the Bill of Rights by engaging in litigation, public education, and advocacy. And I work throughout the uh, central New York area. On the day of the incident, when protesters here in Binghamton were arrested by what was it, eight police forces um, that appeared on Vestal Parkway, I was contacted by some of the people here in Binghamton, and so I've been following what has been happening from afar. Um, the first thing I want to say is that mistakes were made perhaps on both sides. And to some extent, the fact that there were arrests and the fact that there was police brutality represents mistakes made on both sides. And I think that part of what can be learned from this is both your rights and your limits. We very much support the right to free speech, to exercise free speech in a lawful manner. We don't necessarily support breaking the law in order to exercise your right to convey a message. We will observe it. And that's why I'm going to leave the talk about civil disobedience to my much more experienced colleagues to the right. But let me talk about what you do have the right to do and what you don't. The first question is to permit or not to permit. Do you need a permit when you're protesting? And excuse sounding like a lawyer for a second, but it depends. And actually, I'm not an attorney, but um, you have an absolute right to protest on a public sidewalk or in the public square, as long as you're not so large of a group as to be perceived by the authorities as an unlawful assembly. And in Binghamton, that could be 21 people or more. And that differs municipality to municipality. Some municipalities, more than two people can be considered an unlawful assembly. But as long as you're on a public sidewalk or in the public square, you can exercise your First Amendment rights as long as you're not too large a group and as long as you're not blocking access to and egress from buildings or along the sidewalk. So you can exercise your free speech rights in small groups on public property. Not all pieces of public property, however, are legally considered public forum locations. A real good example is the post office. There are some pieces of public property that have never been open for rampant First Amendment activities. The post office grounds is an example of a public piece of property that's never been a public forum. But if there is any history of a piece of public property being a public forum location, they can't close it down based on the content of your speech. They can't allow an evangelist in the public square and then not allow an anti-war protester. Once they've opened it up for one kind of speech, they have to open it up for other sorts of speech. You can also engage in a protest march on the sidewalk. It's really good if you're not occupying the entire sidewalk, because then they could close you down because you are blocking access. 
but I've been in a number of marches where there was no permit required, and yet 20 to 30 to 50 people or more marched through the streets of Syracuse or another city while staying completely on the sidewalk. You don't need a permit for that. And you don't need a permit if you're doing a march like that and crossing the street just like any other pedestrian. So in a situation where you're a small group, you're not blocking access and egress, you don't need a permit to exercise your First Amendment rights. However, the second that you step into the street, it legally changes your protest activity into what is called a parade. And a municipality can require you to apply for a permit for a protest in the street, for a parade, or for a larger group of people. They can also require you to request a permit for certain types of public locations. For instance, in Syracuse, if you want to do a protest on the steps of City Hall, you need to request a permit, even if you're a small group. And that's within a municipality's ability. If you want to amplify your sound with a sound system, there are some municipalities that require you to, you, to, requ to get a permit for sound amplification. You need to remember that not every single public space is a public forum location. Now, what is the government authority to limit you in a public space when you're exercising your First Amendment rights? Well, first of all, if they're going to require a permit, the process has to be reasonable. In Binghamton, they request four weeks in advance. Well, if you wanted to do a protest on the day they bombed Iraq and you didn't know when shock and awe was going to happen, it's not reasonable to ask for four weeks in advance. So there has to be the ability to get a permit quick enough when you have very little notice and the, permit, the protest is related to a particular incident. They also can't charge you an unreasonable fee. They can't charge you $50 when to process the silly pieces of paper basically costs about $5 worth of staff time. They can only charge you a reasonable fee. They also cannot require insurance in such a way that would prohibit a small nonprofit or cash poor group from being able to do their demonstration. And there is a requirement in Binghamton, in the city of Binghamton, that you have to get insurance for some protests. And if they don't waive it for a group that can't afford it, you should contact me, because we believe that requirement may indeed be unconstitutional. And if you look on the back of these uh, folders here that say protesting in central New York, you'll see references to the permit process in Binghamton. Now, they can put restrictions on a protest. They have to be reasonable. And they can put restrictions on the time, the place, and the manner in which you protest. For instance, anybody ever protested in New York City? Raise your hand if you have. Can you put a sign on a stick in New York? No. no. Not anymore. You can put it on a cardboard tube. That's a restriction on the manner of protest in New York, and that's reasonable. A restriction on sound amplification is also reasonable. Let's say that you wanted to protest in front of a courthouse, and our moderator is standing by the courthouse. It's reasonable that they would put you 10 feet away from the courthouse door. That's a restriction on place. What they can't do is what they tried to do in New York when they told people who wanted to protest near the United Nations that the only place that was legal was six blocks away. They can't make a restriction that makes your messaging ineffective. They also have to have clarity and consistency in their policies. They have to have a policy that they apply to everybody, and they apply in the same way. Syracuse wanted to impose a requirement of a protest fee on the Syracuse Peace Council for the largest demonstration that had happened in that city since the Vietnam War. But they had never officially changed the policy. So I went to the city attorney and I went to the chief of police and I said, you can't do this. It's arbitrary and capricious. You officially change your policy for everybody, fine. You do it clearly in writing, fine. You have it. Same forms, says no fee. You can't just impose it. And it looks like you're imposing it because it's an anti-war demonstration. Can't do that. 
So they have to have consistency, they have to have clarity, and they have to provide people access equally. For instance, how many of you are within five years of high school? Okay, do you ever have a military recruiter come into your high school? Okay, if the military recruiters are allowed in your high school to express free speech, so are the people that come in to talk about counter recruitment and alternatives to military service. Because free speech has to be an equal access exercise. So if they allow one type of speech, they can't disallow another type of speech. And any rule they have must be content neutral. A Little bit about the police, and this gets to the heart of what happened, and here I'll wrap up. First of all, if you are engaging in a protest that does not require a permit, there is absolutely nothing wrong with a polite notification to the local police, hey, we don't need a permit, but we're gonna be there, and we just wanted to say, howdy, we're gonna be here in advance. Some people don't like talking to the police at all, and you don't have to. But sometimes it really smooths the way to develop a rapport with the police that are gonna hear about this, maybe get a complaint, maybe misinterpret it, and then react to the scene with attitude. It's always better, in my estimation, to have an advanced conversation with them, explain what you're gonna do, and get a sense whether or not they're gonna be testy in advance. When you are interacting with the police while you're exercising your lawful First Amendment constitutional rights, if a police officer gives you a direct order, whether or not that order violates your rights, whether or not that order makes sense or not, if you disobey the direct orders of a police officer, you're doing what's called risking arrest. They should give you a warning and tell you what you have to do to avoid arrest, but they don't have to. They also don't have to give you time to comply. But in a protest situation, the thing to remember if you're choosing not to get arrested is comply, contact the ACLU later. Comply, contact the legal team later. Because the Constitution does not prevent the police from violating your rights. It gives you solid legal ground to seek redress afterwards. Some police officers are professionals. They see the Bill of Rights as their code of conduct. <clears throat> cops can be pros, believe it or not. And you just hope that they send the cops that are pros to your demonstrations. Some cops are pros but just had a really bad day. Don't assume that all police officers are going to be obnoxious, they're not. But any time that you're doing a protest, and a police officer is sent there by their commander, they're going to be pissed off because they're being taken off patrol and sent to observe you instead and they think it's a waste of police resources. That's how they think, be aware of that. If somebody is being arrested, do not interfere. If Tariq is being arrested by this gentleman, I should not get any closer than this. As soon as I get this close, I am risking arrest because it could be perceived as if I'm interfering with police activities. The other thing, if Danny is the cop, never touch the cop. If you walk out of here from anything, the thing to remember is never touch the cop. Do not touch the police officer, do not touch the police officer's things. As soon as you touch a police officer, you're gonna be arrested too sweet and probably with some force. If you're going to observe, and you have a right to observe, observe at a distance. If the police officer says, please step away, step away four to six feet and stop. If he says step away again, step another four to six feet. Make sure you have distance. Comply and seek redress later. Last thing. In a demonstration, getting arrested is a choice, and it's a choice that should not be taken lightly. Getting arrested, even from disorderly conduct, can have ramifications later on in your life. Want to be a teacher? Well, it could be dicey if you have a prior arrest on your record. Want to become a lawyer? 
When it comes to the ethics review before you're admitted to the bar, you're going to have to explain why you had an arrest, even for a misdemeanor. So please do not make the choice to get arrested without thinking it through. Have a plan, and if there's an opportunity to comply and you weren't planning to get arrested, step back and think first. If you're choosing to get arrested and you're choosing to violate the law to make your message, that may be a legitimate thing to you for you to do, but there's still, still things you need to plan about, and Grace is going to talk about some of that. That's sort of the rough and ready, really quick and dirty review of your rights. For those of you that want to take one or more or 10 of these reviews of your rights away, please do. There's also a sheet here that talks about when police question you and how police move in steps from questioning to detaining to arresting. I don't have time to go over this now uh, unless there's questions. But some of these materials are things that you should be reviewing if you choose to get into a situation where you may be interacting with police. Okay, thanks, uh, Barry Gawanter from the Central New York chapter of the New York uh, Civil Liberties Union. And now we'll move on to Grace Ritter, activist from Ithaca. Hi. Um, I guess uh, the very first thing, um, I'd like to know how many people in this room um, were part of the group that was arrested in the streets. Great. Um, so I'm sure that just from that experience, you learned a lot about the whole process of getting arrested and um, uh, what, what your rights actually feel like once you're in that position. Even if you know exactly what your rights are, a lot of times uh, the cops can either lie to you, um, and they do quite often, um, or you know, just make you feel so insignificant that you don't assert yourself. Um, so one thing, I mean, it's, it's very hard for me to assert myself when I'm being arrested, I and mean, I've been arrested quite a few times, um, but each time it can be really difficult. But I would really encourage you all um, to, to remember um, your rights when you're being arrested if you choose to do that. Um, one really good resource I found today was um, the National Lawyers Guild has a website, and um, they have a little uh, downloadable uh, thing about uh, your rights uh, when you're questioned by police on the street, if you're stopped, you're detained, um, and if you're arrested. Um, and um, they even have a little section for if you're under 18, um, because a lot of times you will be uh, told that you don't have certain rights if you're under 18 or if you're not a citizen. Um, but you still do have rights. And um, one of them is the right to remain silent. Um, as a lot of you know, you probably, uh, when you're arrested, don't get read your Miranda rights, as you see in uh, all of the movies. Um, sometimes they do, but most of the time, they don't read you your rights. But you do have the right to remain silent. And as they say, anything you say can be used against you. Um, so it's good to remember that. And sometimes you do want to talk to the cops and just, you know, let them know that you are a human being and you should be treated as such. Um, but sometimes it's really in your best interest to remain silent um, at certain points in the process, at least. Um, uh, and you cannot legally be arrested for not talking to the police. So if they stop you, um, in a lot of places, you do actually need to give your name. But beyond that, um, if they arrest you, then, uh, then that's something that you could bring up again in court, at least. Um, let's see. What else do I have written down about that? Um, also, if they want to search something of yours, um, be very clear that you don't consent to that search. Um, don't physically resist them, uh, because then you're very likely to be given extra charges. But um, be very clear about that. Um, about police lying, um, they, they will 
<coughs> lie very often about all sorts of things. Um, sometimes it's just because they, uh, you know, they don't want to bother with doing something. There was, uh, during the RNC protests, I was involved in a march uh, up Broadway, and we ended up having a die-in in the middle of the street. Um, and everybody was deciding to, to walk with the police to the vans once they'd been arrested. But um, I had decided that I wasn't going to walk. I was going to stay lying in the middle of the ground and that they would have to drag me away. And there were a few other people who had also made that decision. But the cop came over and we were the last group because they, they were putting off dragging us away. Um, but he said to us, you know, there's thousands of people that have been arrested this weekend, and um, I'm going to make sure that you guys are the last ones out of jail because you're making me drag you away, and I'm going to hurt my back, and um, I, it's going to be my personal thing. I'm not going to, I'm going to make sure that this is really hell for you. And um, so everybody else in my group decided to walk. Um, but I decided, uh, like, well, what the hell? I'm going to be here the whole weekend anyway. So, um, uh, so I made them drag me away. Um, but just sort of, um, I don't know if it was an idle threat on his part or I got shuffled up in the mix. But anyway, I was actually released 12 to 24 hours before the other people in my group who walked away. Um, so. <laughs> So that was just one example of a lie. But they can also lie to you about things that may be more serious, like um, what your, your end charges will be, um, and uh, just to intimidate you into doing something or providing information. Um, and just remember that you, know, you have the right to remain silent. And um, yes, uh, some of the safest things to say are, I'm going to remain silent. I would like to see my lawyer, or a lawyer, and um, I do not consent to a search. Um, and even if you have answered some of their questions throughout the process, you can always stop answering questions at any point. Um, another thing is if you're stopped on the street, um, say you're in a protest and uh, uh, the cop stops you, um, you should always ask them, am I free to go? Um, if they haven't said you're under arrest, then that should be your question. Um, if they say, no, stay here, um, then you should ask, am I under arrest? If they say no, then that means you're being detained. Um, you still have the same rights then. You don't have to answer their questions. Um, if you are being treated badly, uh, physically or otherwise, or if you're witnessing somebody else uh, being brutalized in any way, um, make sure to get the badge number and name of that officer. Um, write that all down. Try to get witnesses in the area um, who've also seen, seen the same incident. And if there's any injuries, um, seek metal, medical attention, but also take a picture of that injury. Um, for uh, the future. Um, so remember you have the right to assert yourself in, in, uh, for your, your rights and also to advocate for others. Um, if you're being arrested um, and you see that someone needs attention, um, sometimes when uh, there's a mass arrest, people's cuffs can be put on too tight occasionally. And this has happened in many situations that I've been in. Um, the, the plastic flexi cuffs can get pulled really tight and um, sort of cut off circulation in people's wrists. Um, so you, know, you can help those people by doing a lot of different things. Uh, if everybody knows that somebody is in a lot of pain and they're being neglected, you can um, you know, start chanting. Or uh, if, you're being, if you're put on a bus uh, and you're waiting, you can rock the, bu the bus a little bit with everyone. Um, you want to make sure that those people get attention because they have the right uh, to get medical attention if that's what they need. Um, uh, 
And one thing that I want to add, um, in case anybody is interested in organizing more civil disobedience um, in the future, something that is really, really useful is organizing affinity groups. Um, in affinity groups, when you're, you're organizing an action, this is sort of um, an affinity group can be made up of uh, three to 20 people or so. And um, it's a way to look after each other. Um, everybody can be assigned uh, different roles in the affinity group, such as um, a street medic, jail support, legal counsel, um, if you have those types of people in your group, um, or you know, people who are designated as the arrestees or the people who are willing to risk arrest. Um, it's just really helpful to, uh, to support each other through this. And for those of you who um, maybe got arrested uh, without planning to, um, you know that uh, it can be really um, scary to suddenly be in that situation and not know um, what's going to happen to you. But if you know that there's people on the outside who are making sure uh, they're tracking where you are through the system or they're going to be at the jail when you get out and you have a way to get home, um, things like that, it makes it a lot more doable and um, a lot less frightening. Um, I guess I'm going to uh, let Danny speak now about his experiences on the inside. <laughs> Or something else. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Danny Burns. Um, uh, you might ask yourself, why would I want to go through this? Why would I go to a protest? Why would I risk arrest? Uh, why would I consider even risking any kind of jail time or a trial or something? And um, you know, why do we go? Why do we do this? Why do we show up tonight? Um, and uh, one reason is I think it was like 49 people were killed in Iraq because he went wearing U.S. uniforms last month. That's like the highest in seven months, and like uh, over hundreds, hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians are dead. And does anybody here have any brothers or sisters, little brothers? Anybody got a little brother or a little sister? Could you imagine just for a moment? And I'm sorry to ask you to do this. If somebody killed him, or her, or just blew them up with a bomb, what that might feel like. And so that's why we go, because we don't want to be responsible for that. We don't want somebody's parents not to come home, you know. So, uh, so you go to jail overnight, for instance, or for, I went to jail. The longest I went to jail for was six months, you know. And um, I think, you know, those soldiers in Iraq, you know, uh, you know, they're in danger over there, and I'm in. Uh, I'm in like a, you know, a uh, non-violent crowd of uh, inmates in the United States. I'm white. I come from a middle-class family. I'm uh, fairly well-spoken. I have support on the outside. I have a certain amount of entitlement that I just uh, automatically assume, right, because I'm white, you know? And, uh, you know, so I'm not really in any danger at all. No one's going to beat me up without, you know, them finding out, you know what I mean? So. You know, think about, like, you know, if a soldier's got to go over there and do a year over and over again, well, maybe, maybe I can show up to the protest. Maybe I can do a little jail time. Um, even in a violation charge, you can do jail time. And anybody who's got arrested, you'll get the job. It is, you know, whatever happens, you'll be fine. Uh, it, just tell them it was, you know, during... The Iraq War, and what, you know, 20 years from now, I'm like, oh, good thing, it'll actually probably give you the job uh, because of your um, actions. Um, part of the thing with me is, as a, uh, you know, as far as the legal stuff goes, you know, my spiritual stuff. Um, uh, I'm a Catholic. I was raised Catholic, and um, you know, I've got this whole thing where uh, what you do for the least is very important. And uh, I've got these two children who are growing up, you know, and like, you know, I just can't be myself and be silent. And um, I can't, uh, I can't because of this entitlement that I'm given as a, as a, you know, a white male American born citizen in the middle class. Uh, I can go up, well, for instance, I was in at the Republican National Convention 2004, which Grace touched on. I went up, I was with my wife, and I go up to the police officer and I say, excuse me, officer, can you tell me what time it is? And I didn't think, like, any, no different than I asked George here what time it was. She goes, don't do that. I said, what do you mean? He's a good guy. He says, well, if you're African-American, if you're black, Latino or stuff, you can't just, or, or 
or a Mexican, you can't go up and ask a cop that because it's a whole different world for them. So if, if, if they can't, should I, you know? And, um, and so I'm realizing, oh, that's the entitlement that I was born with that I'm trying to, you know, so at the same time, so do I not have a responsibility uh, to, uh, to do certain um, uh, acts of, uh, of protest and uh, of conscience using that because I have it? Uh, um, I think that I should, and uh, so I do. Um, I, I'm pretty sure, any time I do an act of civil disobedience or, or risk arrest or whatever, I'm pretty sure I know what the outcome's going to be. Um, uh, because I've never done anything that hasn't been done before. Um, as they say, there's no new fix. I, uh, I poured blood on a recruiter wall and got blood on an American flag and knelt down and prayed and literally begged uh, a military recruiter, a Marine who was in the back room and came out and found us after we were done and asked him not to follow illegal orders and uh, not to go to Iraq. And um, I knew by looking at the legal system on web and friends of mine who have done it in Washington such that I was risking three to six months. Turned into a whole two trials. I ended up getting charged with um, a conspiracy charge, which we actually found not guilty. And, uh, but the idea is, through all of it, is to raise awareness against the war, to try and stop it. Uh, you know, not at that very moment, I don't think, you know, but it's, as, as being part of a whole, uh, maybe we could stop it with just a little bit. Maybe that march on, you know, down the street in Vessel might help just bring it, you know, a minute or a day or who knows. Who knows? We don't know what our actions are going to do, but we're going to work towards it um, on a, as a, you know, as a whole body in the United States to bring it to an end. Um, uh, the uh, Judge McAvoy uh, is on a transcript of the of the uh, trial of St. Patrick's Four downtown, the second trial, and is saying you can't. And I'm I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have the exact quote in my head, but he said you can't expect to break the law to try and change it. And uh, uh, a lawyer uh, said, Oh, I read that. Can you just imagine a judge saying that in this country? Basically, civil disobedience, risk arrest, and protest is uh, how we got there. And anybody the five-day work week, you know, they didn't, they didn't get that. The eight-hour day, that was not given to us. That, uh, you know, the rights that we have, that you have, are fought for. They were not given, and they're fought for the same way. It has a, it, there's a history of change in this country, and that's how it's done. Um, and because of that, and because of my religious, that's how I do it. Um, I've got notes to bring it to the point that I want to get to. Um, yeah, that one. Da, 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 da. One more. There's one more I want to see. Yeah, as, as far as, um, uh, you know, like the, the, what the laws are and stuff, you do a nonviolence training. I've had those before. Uh, I look at what it's going to be, what the risks are. I've got two young kids, so like a, a violation or a mis misdemeanor, you know, is like the most. I, I, would, I wouldn't do a felony at this time in my life um, or risk a felony. But um, like Grace and I, uh, like a, I, was, I was found guilty of a, of a misdemeanor um, for an action that actually Grace did with us at the recruiting center for St. Patrick's Four, the lesser charge. It was a misdemeanor. And waiting for sentencing, because I, uh, I went to the recruiting center twice, and the first time 13 of us got arrested. Grace was one of them, along with uh, two of my co-defendants. Anyway, long story. But we went to Cuba, which is against the law. And now that's a felony, right? It's a felony. Uh, it's a whole world of problems. But we looked it up. They had, no one's been prosecuted for going to Cuba. We went there between sentencing and um, a verdict. 25 Catholics walked from Santiago to Guantanamo, and we did a vigil for a week. Uh, in Cuba, which is against the law, unless you're Canadian. Um, so we knew what we were risking there. We were risking a felony. We were risking, you know, um, a whole world of trouble. But, the, but the, the truth is, they hadn't done anything since 1988 when somebody tried smuggling <coughs> cigars. And when they do prosecute, they garnish your wages and such. You know, they, they fine you. And in, in our case, uh, the, have any money to garnish. there's no money to garnish. <laughs> But we wanted them to prosecute us so we could go to court and, and bring this up. You know, why are we hiding this prison on this island which nobody on that island wants there? You know what I mean? We're moving them 
off the continent and uh, taking away habeas corpus, not putting them in front of a judge. And is that okay? And if that's the base, if that's the, if that's the bottom when we go up from there, if that actually exists, uh, you know, uh, we're in trouble. And we're in such trouble, we've got this war going on, which is called, they say it costs $27 billion a month, it doesn't, because they're not factoring in the costs after the war and rebuilding after the war and the cost of caring for all these people who have been literally blown apart but they're still breathing. Uh, so it's more like, like I saw, like 45 billion a month. And um, so, and then the dollar, like I went to Canada and I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but Canadian money used to be like a buck 25 to the American. Now it's like, we're 75 cents. They're like, please give me the Canadian now. You know, they wouldn't take Canadian quarters now. They, you know, anyway. I guess you have to be a little older to understand that one. Uh, so we're charging this entire thing, and I don't think no Tark's going to talk about finances, but like the, the whole world is screwed up now. And so, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to, what's, what's a sane reaction to this war in Iraq the, and the war in Afghanistan and Guantanamo being in existence and there's, there's no habeas corpus, but they don't put the body in front of the judge? You know, what is a sane reaction? A sane reaction is showing up on the street, and the sane reaction is, you know, being thrown in jail overnight or for an hour or two hours or whatever it is. Um, uh, a sane reaction is, uh, you know, um, maybe that, as opposed to thinking, oh, there's nothing I can do, or I'm going to vote Democrat. You know what I mean? So, like, like, it's crazy to do nothing. It's crazy to just you know, figure out where we're going to, oh, there's nothing I can do, it's over there, I don't care, let's go to lunch. That, I think, is insane. What I think is sane is actually um, uh, think for a moment what your line is and what your comfort level is. And if you drive by like people on the corner with, at the, over at the post office every week with, the, with Jim Clune and everybody and, you know, like, oh, man, look at those people there. You know, I would never do that. But, you know what, show up one time. Maybe if your line is just showing up with the, the poster one day or just standing with those people, the, pe the people who are actually doing something and, uh, you know, or go to a meeting or something and, and, you know, just cross the line of comfort a little bit at once in a while and uh, you'll keep your sanity, I promise. Anyway, uh, with that, I'll stop. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Um, my name is Tarkin Delzum, and before I get started here, I had some prepared comments. I just want to warn you that I have a tendency to get a bit emotional. <laughs> I know that there are a lot of people here that will confirm that. I have like a reputation of like the public official who cries. Uh, I, I tell my, you know, my family members, oh, it's perfect. <laughs> Actually, I can't prepare. And I, I mean, it's, it's because uh, this, this topic just it, it fills me with a lot of grief. Um, I, I will say as the, you know, my, I, the deputy mayor, the executive assistant to the mayor, I'm also the deputy commissioner of public safety. Uh, I have an obligation to uphold the laws. Um, I also uh, swore an oath to the United States Constitution. And I think that there are many people here and across, across the country that recognize that the Constitution has been violated by the actions of the presidency. So I feel that in being here today, um, to also share some information about how this war has impacted uh, the community. I'm still, uh, to a great extent, up upholding my duties. Um, so now I'm going to bore you with some numbers. Um, there's a, a, a federal program called the Community Development Block Grant, and uh, it was enacted in 1974. It is widely regarded among all the all the mayors across the country, that the most successful federal local partnership in building communities. Um, the city of Binghamton, uh, just recently, the annual CDB allocation is $2.37 million. It's used for street reconstruction, sewer system upgrades, park improvements, housing re rehabilitation, demolition of blight, code enforcement, small business development, and programs that assist and care for our most vulnerable citizens the elderly, the disabled, the youth, and the poor. So these are, these are real dollars with, with real positive impact in our community. And unfortunately, as many of you know, the Bush administration has purposefully drained these investments to cover the cost of the illegal war and continued occupation in Iraq. So if you consider just over the last five years, 
the same period in which we've been at war with Iraq, the CDBG grant to Binghamton, just to Binghamton, has been slashed by 25%. That's $570,000 in just five years. Um, if we were to broaden our analysis and we look at the numbers statewide, we find the disturbing reality of Bush's priorities and policies. In 2007, and consider this, 341 million went from Washington to the state of New York for the, um, and in that same for community building. And 8 billion went from New Yorkers to Washington just to cover the cost of the continued occupation of Iraq in 2007. 341 million, 8 billion. In other words, if we look at this, for every one tax dollar that Washington sent New York last year to rebuild our neighborhoods, we sent back 24 tax dollars just to cover the costs of the occupation in Iraq. So, it gets worse. Um, I'm glad I have a whole box of tissues. Uh, in his final budget, which was just introduced in January, President Bush has proposed cutting the CDBG budget again, this time by a whopping 18% to an all-time low of 2.9 million. 25 years ago, this program was funded at 3 billion. It's funded more 25 years ago. Um, if you also compare that to the 500 billion we've already paid for the war in Iraq, the anticipated 1 trillion this war will cost in the end. And there are estimates of even uh, higher amounts. So sadly, but not surprisingly, the Community Development Block Grant is not the only program to lose tax dollars to the Iraq War. Uh, uh, altogether, there have been 151 different federal programs that have been either eliminated or slashed in President Bush's final proposed budget. He's slashed housing assistance, workforce training, veteran care, federal highway programs. Uh, as energy prices soar to record levels, Bush, the compassionate, has proposed slashing by 22% the program that offers assistance to low-income families to cover heating bills. Um, he's proposed a 27% cut to special housing for the elderly, a 32% cut to housing for people with disabilities. He hopes to completely eliminate two very successful law enforcement programs, completely eliminate cops, which puts police officers in our public schools, and the Justice Assistance Grant Program. Uh, this would result in a 10 million loss for New York. He wants to eliminate the Supplemental education, uh, Educational Opportunity Grants, which amounted to approximately 67 million for New York students. He also wants to end the Community Services Block Grant, which served 2.7 million poor New Yorkers last year through education, employment, and health programs. These are very real costs. According to the Independent Center on, on Budget Policy and Priorities, the drastic cuts in domestic spending have been in contrast to the dra dramatic rise in spending for defense and related programs. They state since 2001, funding for defense and war making has increased an annual rate of 8% after adjusting for inflation and population. And true to his stubborn form, you got to give the guy credit for consistency. In his last year, our great decider has proposed increasing Pentagon spending by again 7.5% to $515 billion, which now accounts for more than half of all discretionary spending. This is where it gets a little difficult. So you say, you know, just numbers on a page, but then you uh, try, sp try spending a week in the mayor's office. Uh, excuse me. You got to read the letters from the elderly pleading for help with the cost of heating. You got to listen to young fathers asking for jobs so they can pay the rent, keep their families together. You have to respond to those on fixed incomes asking for free legal assistance to avoid losing their home. You got to apologize to residents complaining to sewage backup or moon-sized potholes, even though you don't have anywhere near the resources necessary to make the repairs of a crumbling infrastructure. So this is uh, the accurate backdrop for those who exercised their right to dissent on March 18th. Not the cheap inversion that the media packaged for entertainment. The uni university students and community members were in the streets not to clash with the police, 
That was not their goal. They were in the streets exercising their right to dissent against a government that refuses to end a five-year war, that drains our nation's treasury, places a crushing financial burden on our children and grandchildren, violates international law, bankrupts our moral authority, kills or maims our soldiers, kills or maims hundreds and thousands of Iraqis, displaces more than four million Iraqis, unsettles all of the Middle East, and in every way possible, compromises our national security. So what disappointed me most, though, was not the media's representation of that event. As an advocate for media reform efforts for the last 10 years, I was not surprised at all by the coverage. It was the knee-jerk response from some community members that caused a great deal of sorrow and disappointment. And there were generally two sentiments. The first response that the students caused a great deal of inconvenience to others. But, uh, you know, you, you have to ask, which is worse, an anniversary anti-war protest that inconvenienced approximately 200 motorists for 20 minutes, or five years of war that has made refugees of one of every six Iraqi? Which is worse, a parkway march that caused a rubberneck accident, or a military occupation starting its sixth year that has destroyed, directly or indirectly, a nation's essential infrastructure, including water filtration plants, schools, hospitals, transit systems, and electrical grids. The second response, that the students wasted tax dollars, since so many law officers were ordered to the parkway. But, but again, I ask which is worse, the 3,000 tax bill from 20 local police officers dispatched for a few hours to contain a nonviolent protest, or one trillion dollar tax bill from a military ordered against U.S. constitutional and international law to invade and occupy a sovereign nation for more than five years. And when I state that, I put the blame not on the soldiers. This is a hierarchy. It goes straight up to the commander in chief. It's the policy makers. So, no matter how hard the media tries to reduce this incident to a soap opera drama between cops and protesters, we cannot overlook the original outrage that compelled our fellow citizens into the streets on the anniversary of a tragic and unpopular war. That the above sentiments were echoed by so many caused me great sorrow and shame. So we must continue to engage this myopia with courage, respect, and kindness. And I applaud the organizers of this panel for assisting in that effort. So finally, let me just ask, are we not a nation born of protest and dissent? Do we not stand on the shoulders of agitators and protesters who demand a change in the face of unjust and criminal practices? Anybody who dismisses so quickly the act of protest turns a blind eye to one of the greatest legacies that define our nation. If there had been no dissent, we would still be a colony under the yoke of the English crown. If there had been no dissent, the privilege of the vote would still be limited to only white male landowners. If there had been no dissent, our dear brothers and sisters of color would still be chained in the fields and sold like cattle at auction blocks in our town squares. If there had been no dissent, we would all still be working six days a week with no rights, in assembly lines next to 10-year-olds under condition that would kill us by the time we were 40. If there had been no dissent, our friends of the LGBTQ communities would still be hiding in secrecy, terrified by the bigotry and violence of false righteousness. So as history has proven time and again, it is often the agitators and the protesters that reset our moral compass. And as history also proves, it is these same agitators who are redeemed as heroes because they moved our democratic experiment of freedom, justice, and liberty closer to perfection. So should any person in the face of unjust and criminal actions choose to carry this great legacy of dissent forward in the spirit of nonviolence, then I stand with them in solidarity with pride and gratitude. Thanks. Boy, Tarek, if that didn't wake us up, we must be dead. Okay, so thank you, Barry. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Tarek. Audience question. The Binghamton School District allows recruiters into the schools. Does this mean they have to also give access to groups wishing to do counter-recruitment? 
Also, can you clarify the guidelines for when it is permissible to demonstrate on private property? All right, first of all, if somebody wants to go into a high school where there's been military recruiters and they want to do some kind of counter recruitment education and the high school says no, you need to contact me because we will go to bat, even if we have to court, go to court to force them to obey the equal access laws. And if I had known about this, I would have, on your behalf, contacted the legal counsel for the Binghamton City School District and explained the law. And I've had to do that in Syracuse, and I've been successful in getting some of the uh, counter-recruitment people into high schools. Um, so if this is the case, please talk to me afterwards. And the first time you're admitted into the high school, I'll be right by your side in the cafeteria or by the table watching you exercise your First Amendment rights. Okay, um, remember that I said you had an absolute right to protest on public property. You can protest on private property if you have the permission of the private property owner. So if the owner of that mall had no problem with you being there, then there was nothing to stop you. And one of the things I often tell people is you can do anything you want until you're given a lawful instruction not to. So I would say try it. And if you are given a direct lawful instruction by a uh, by a police officer to cease and desist and leave the property, you fail to do so, you're going to get arrested. Malls are an interesting case. Um, indoor malls are allowed to discriminate based on content. And this comes up all the time in Syracuse. Because people that are doing anti-war press protesting or animal rights protesting cannot protest in Carousel Mall because they don't have the permission of the owners. Um, so it, it really depends on whether the private property owner is going to let you. But let's take the case of Walmart, for instance. Some friends of mine in the labor movement wanted to protest outside of Walmart because of their awful labor practices. Well, they couldn't protest in the parking lot because Walmart, who owned the property, didn't permit it. But there was a right of way along the road that is public property. And you can find out through the city where that public property right of way, that's the equivalent of a sidewalk, even if it's grass, exists. And even in a situation like that, if it's along the roadway, there's got to be a place where you can single file do your protesting. And if for some reason you're not sure what's public, what's private, you've got a sympathetic soul in the mayor's office who can help you figure that out. And if you want to know something about your rights or how to get your rights exercised when you're being blocked, then I'm the person to call. Audience question. Even if a recruiter is on private property, public tax money is still paying the recruiter's salary. Does this fact affect the rights of a person or group wishing to demonstrate on that private property? If the private property owner admits the recruiter onto the private property, it's the discretion of the private property owner who they say they can let on and, let on and not let on. However, they cannot, in the case of a public accommodation, like a mall or a store, prohibit somebody on the basis of their status in a protected class. What I mean by that is that New York State Human Rights Law says that employment, housing, or public accommodation, you can't discriminate on the basis of race, age, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, and a whole bunch of other protected, uh, protected classes. So a mall owner can't say, uh, you person who are a white person of European descent, you can be here protesting but you people who are African American or Muslim American doing exactly the same thing, then you get into dicey territory with New York State human rights law. So a private property owner who is uh, doing something that is a public accommodation in the law cannot do so in a way that is discriminatory 
in violation of New York State human rights law. Specific cases, I need all the facts and where you are and who you are and who they let and who they didn't, because these sort of things you got to look at a case by case basis. Audience question. It seems that we need to open up more public space and at the same time limit the amount of space which is defined as private and thus excludes protest. Do any of you know how we can accomplish this? In Ithaca, um, they won't let you wear a sign, but we all took our shopping bags and put anti-war signs on the shopping bags and we put signs on our shirts and we all walked around single file silently the last Saturday before Christmas and the same thing with Thanksgiving for a few years there and then we were escorted out when the police got there and we didn't argue with them, we just did it for as long as we wanted. Um, the other thing, like, like for me, like when I'm hearing with these guys going back and forth, I can, I can pretty much tell you if you go into the recruiting center and you're not supposed to and then you don't leave, uh, I can tell you what would happen if you went into um, with 3,000 signatures signed asking uh, a congressperson not to, to no longer fund the war and then refuse to leave if they won't even talk to you and a closing time comes. Um, that kind of thing. Because uh, like, I don't particularly think that, like, like I thought of, uh, I was driving down the street and Democracy Now! comes on and, and Amy, Amy Goodman says, and in Binghamton, New York, or Vestal, I think she said Binghamton though, uh, you know, the protesters are violently arrested and they for marching and they could, because they, they went into the street. You know, we did that uh, in Ithaca um, after the election. The next night, we all met at the Commons and there's probably 75 people. We just like, forget the permits, man. Come on, forget the sidewalk. It's over. You know what I mean? We already tried that. We tried writing uh, letters to our Congress people. We tried, you know, uh, writing letters to the editor. We did the permitted march. It didn't work. You know, forget the sidewalk. Take the street every time. And, uh, and whenever the, when, when, the, when the reporters come to you and say, well, you know, this and this, these little nitpicky thing about the police, forget the fucking police. Talk about the war. Bring it right back to the war every time. Well, you know what? When the police were doing that, uh, three people were killed that day in Iraq, probably. How many of you know what I mean? Find out that information. Oh, you know, when, the, when, we were, when we were in that courtroom today, you know, don't even give them what they're saying. Just tell them, tell them what's going on in Iraq on that day. Bring it back to the war every single time because it's reformed to raise awareness against the war. It's not about the Vestal Police. They acted like police. They didn't do anything outrageous. That's nothing. I mean, you got pepper sprayed in the face by a cop. That happens in other countries, in other parts of this city, and in this other parts of this country every day, all the time. But not to white Americans. That's what the big surprise is. Anyway. Thank you. I, I would, just to try to answer that, I guess it's a very difficult question, is that, I mean, you're talking about the loss of of the public commons, you're talking about physical space, and it's no secret that we are continually losing that. Um, at the same time, it's not just physical space, uh, but it's also kind of civic mindedness. Uh, you know, Putnam's seminal piece, Bowling Alone, it's that we have lost a sense of collective ethic um, that once grounded this nation, and, and I think that is just as troubling. So. Uh, one thing I would say is make sure we don't lose those remaining places we have uh, and try to cultivate again this sense of uh, shared collective spirit. I mean, these are our investments that uh, are being determined by, you know, someone who is incredibly irresponsible in the White House. Uh, they affect all of us. Uh, the other thing I would say is that the privatization of more and more public spaces and services is not ending. It's continuing. Um, and where the question would be is if municipalities do pursue that or any other public uh, uh, body is can you still write in if you privatize the highways if you privatize the railways um, are we, we should ensure that those still are places where we can engage in our civic activity to me I mean it's, it's really hard to say how do we reclaim the ones we've lost I think it's you have to focus on not losing any more and, and just to add on that from an experience in Syracuse you mentioned investment. If Binghamton City tax dollars are going to a development of a new mall or a new space, something where there could be a public square, but because it's private property that's being developed, it's eliminated. If there's going to be a payment in lieu of taxes or some kind of city grant, put pressure on your city councilors to require free speech space.
be incorporated into the contracts for the development, into the contracts for the pilot, the payment in lieu of taxes. It should be a condition of new developments supported with tax dollars that there be a preservation of free speech space. And I think also I just wanted to bring up one thing that you had mentioned before about um, going to a place and um, waiting until you have you know, a command or a request to leave that space. Um, I think it is sort of good to, to push it sometimes. Um, you know, if, if we want to try to have a presence at um, the recruiting station, even though it's private, if you're there for five minutes and people see you and then you're asked to leave, maybe it's worth it. Um, and you're taking back that public space for a little bit of time. And you're also, uh, every time you're talking to a recruiter, he's not recruiting. And um, if we could get everybody to call up the recruiter and say, listen, my kid, he's got a good dad, da 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 it's adopt a recruiter. He'll keep coming over to the house and he'll keep doing all this thing. And just, like, he's never going to get him, but he doesn't know it. And we could, like, I mean, we could make an effect if we did a you know, program like that. Adopt a recruiter. I see George inviting him over, you know, give him some, something to drink, have a seat, leave everybody alone while you're here with me. Audience question. In theory, the citizens make the laws. So how did repressive laws such as those which limit lawful assembly come to be on the books? The law is evaluated by the courts. When a government takes action that seems to violate people's rights and that person fights back and takes it to the court, the court is going to evaluate it as a balance test. The government can't take action that is in the government interests but violates a person's rights too much. The courts are going to look at the government interest in interpreting the law a particular way and the person's interest in their rights being maintained and if it is out of balance so the government wins too much, the courts are going to say the government can't do as much restriction it has to be in balance. And the court is going to give more weight to the individual right because of exactly what Tariq said earlier. Um, but it is a matter of balance and interpretation. And to some extent, the government can do anything they want until we, the individual, challenge it. And one of the reasons my organization is out there, because you may not know how to challenge it on your own. You need the legal assistance. It goes back to the balance test because in the law it says that you can have something called an unlawful assembly and the government gets to determine what an unlawful assembly is. Um, if you don't think that's reasonable, then by all means push your legislators to pass a law that that's an arbitrary number and should be changed. But a municipality can determine what's an unlawful assembly and there's a reason within the law for that right being there. It's basically to allow the police when they need to, to deal with a potential riot. I'd also say that I mean, we know that the political and the legal systems are not immune to the same power dynamics that are emblematic in any human system. So I think we've seen a, a presidency that has wanted to push the limits. And Barry has a great deal of faith in the balance. I don't. I mean, we've seen where that uh, there are judges and judicial appointments that are, have been put in there specifically to continue pushing that limit. And so the balance comes from exercising our rights. And if we are afraid to dissent, if we are afraid to challenge, um, then I, I think we surrender something that's very important to our system. But this is. I mean, I think that's why there's a lot of uh, what the administration does, uh, the, the Ryan administration, there have been a lot of critics because challenging power structures. You want to empower marginalized communities, disenfranchise, give voice to the voiceless. And that it works wonderfully well when you have it operating both from down below and up above. But when, those, when there are those in power who are going to take advantage of the legal and the political systems, um, to try to consolidate that, then we all better wake up and understand that it's our responsibility and our obligation. I was impressed when, when during the St. Patrick's Four trial, when Congressman Maury Sinchi came down and gave an, an incredible speech, 
saying that it was an, our obligation to engage in similar activities uh, when, our, when those in charge, when we believe those in charge uh, are engaging in criminal or unjust policies. Stunning from a congressman in 2005 when the, the, the tone and the mood around the Iraq war uh, wasn't as strong as it is now. Uh, but that's precisely what needs to happen uh, from the bottom up. Also, we enforce the laws that exist. Uh, Article 2, Section, no, no, Article, Article 2, Section 4, the United States Constitution reads, International law is the supreme law of the land and all treaties. Uh, signed under by the United States are to be the supreme law of the land and, and it supersedes all other laws under any state or local judges are hereby, uh, you know, it goes on almost like it's really clear and it says notwithstanding at the end, which means no exceptions, you know. Uh, Article 6, Section 2. And what that means is uh, international law and the treaties that we sign with other countries only get enforced by this government if it's like copyright laws and, and trade laws, you know, where we're getting the, the people with the money getting screwed. But um, the uh, uh, Nuremberg Principles state, which is a treaty we signed, uh, that says when you know your government's doing something illegal and you do nothing to stop it, you are culpable in that crime. Because when everybody got in Germany was put on, on the stand, they said, well, I was just following orders. Well, you knew they were doing something illegal. Yeah, but I was ordered to do it. Well, that's no longer a defense. So now you guys know that what the government is doing is illegal, and now if you do nothing about it, you're culpable, and potentially you're going to be charged with, cr with crimes uh, when this is all over. And, and so when we, when we went into the courtroom and we said that, um, in the first trial, uh, we were allowed to say it because it said uh, we went in and destroyed property, um, but it didn't say, uh, it didn't say um, regardless of intent. And... It didn't say, because it said that, by no, that we had no reasonable means to think that we were um, uh, uh, legally could do that. Uh, I got that quote wrong, but it didn't say regardless of intent. So if this charge that these guys on Vessel Avenue got charged, if it says regardless of intent, uh, you can't talk about why you went on the street. But if it doesn't say regardless of intent, you can on the stand say, I, my intent was... Just because I wanted to raise awareness against this war, I wanted, you know, I mean, you can just go on with it and on with it and get it on the books and get it on paper and get it in the record books. And, you know, the media probably won't cover that part of it because they never do. But, you know, it's all like we don't enforce the laws that are already on the books. If we did, Bush would be out of office. He would have been impeached. We've got, a, we've got a Democratic, we've got a Democrat, we, remember when we elected the Democrats into Congress and the Senate? We thought, oh, they're going to stop it now. They haven't done anything. What have they done? Name one thing that they promised to do before they got elected. They haven't impeached the president. They haven't brought back Hebrews Corpus. They haven't closed Guantanamo. They haven't stopped the war. They haven't even in, in, asked them, to, they haven't given them a timeline. They've done absolutely nothing. And so when you think that, when, when we're all stuck thinking that, oh, it's important to vote, isn't it? <laughs> really? It's important to vote. It's important to, to sign the letters and talk to the Congress people. And it's important to protest. And it's important to gather and change the laws and have them also enforced. Audience question. We are currently seeing a wave of consolidation of private property due to the mortgage crisis. Is the city of Binghamton taking any steps to freeze foreclosures? I wish we had the authority to do that. It wouldn't be the municipality that has that authority. I wish we had the resources as well. We don't. Uh, I will say that uh, the foreclosure crisis uh, has not, uh, uh, it has not been a major problem here. We never experienced the housing boom in Binghamton. <laughs> so it's kind of been like a normalized ray. Uh, we're still going up, you know, I mean, which is good. Uh, <laughs> But uh, again, one of, the, one of the greatest resources for the municipality is the Community Development Block Grant. Uh, it comes with the HOME, uh, uh, which is another program from Housing and Urban Development, and they have just been slashed repeatedly. Uh, it's, it's really distressing. We'd love to try to be as creative as possible. In fact, we've been finding far more assistance from the state through a blight removal and demolition program where we're not just demolishing buildings, but we're taking a lot of uh, low-income uh, renters or homeowners and we're committing funds for rehabilitation and trying to secure home ownership. But there has been more assistance from the state than the feds. Audience question. It seems that to accept the concept of free speech zones would be a form of capitulation, 
How can we stop governments from imposing these unconstitutional limits on free speech? Can I quickly just jump on that? Is that one, I agree with you. Uh, free, free speech zones, when they're set up um, around an event, I think it's a complete spectacle. And I don't think that there should be much compliance with that. Uh, they're playpens. They're playpens, exactly. I mean, one of the things is, you know, we've, we've moved forward with grassroots democracy, neighborhood assemblies. It's messy. It's extremely messy democracy. If you want to be true to its, its, its terms, uh, it's like a, a raucous scream and exchange back and forth, but that's what it is. And the attempt to kind of put it in a playpen uh, on 89th Street, you know, it's clear of, a, it's just absurd. Uh, I think, though, what, what, what Barry was talking about was that to whenever there's public financing, maybe even a, that was already a private space, but if we commit public resources, you could use that as a tool to leverage further, uh, you know, to, to zones that you would be able to continue free speech. But around an event when they set that up, you're right, it's a spectacle. Yeah, protest pens are unconstitutional, and we have fought them. As a matter of fact, we just got the, the uh, New York City Police Department to agree to stop some of the practices that they did back when UFPJ did their protest that they wanted to do at the United Nations. And the police set up protest pens and wouldn't let people go from one pen to the other. We fought in court about that, and we just finally, after all this time, finally got a, them to agree that they would not prevent people from going to one cordoned off area to another, and that they would give people time to get away if they decided to bring in their horses. Protest pens are totally, totally counter to what America is about. The only thing that they can do if they set up different areas is to basically prevent counter protesters from going at each other. That should really be the only reason that they set up a barrier, that and keeping the people uh, that are accessing and egressing a building or a sidewalk safe. But if they say, this is your free speech zone, and it's a public space, contact me, because we're going to fight that. Because almost every single public space should be a free speech zone. What I was suggesting earlier is carving out something within a private space when taxpayer dollars are used. Um, and that's completely separate from what I'm talking about. Even if those play pens were legal and were um, you know, the way people protested. Um, I think really it's our job, everybody's job here who's invested in ending the war in Iraq and, and making a better world for all of us to be really, really creative at this point. Um, you know, uh, when, you, when you see like guerrilla fighters, um, they're always one step ahead of the major government um, armies because they're being creative and they're using new tactics all the time. And we also have to do that in a nonviolent way, but um, constantly be, be on the move, um, creating new tactics. And because they are always going to be able to spin it and say, oh, this is so great, our democracy is working, until there's something that they don't know how to deal with again. Um, and, and also, I wanted to um, reiterate what you were saying about, well, just um, bring up the uh, war tax resistance, um, because that is really what is going to hit them hardest. And yes, it is against the law, but um, it makes a difference um, when we see our tax dollars going towards this war, and pretty much only this war, um, more and more as you see the numbers. Um, I mean, can you feel all right with knowing that that's your money going there? Um, so uh, some of us have made the choice to not pay our federal income tax because of that. Um, and so that's one option. Audience question, what are some effective strategies we can adopt in order to limit the government's ability to repress us 
or to engage in illegal wars such as that in Iraq. Well, one is, one, one is the war tax resistance again. I intentionally, my wife and I, we and, and others in Ithaca and, and, and Grace, we intentionally make, we live, be, we live below the federal taxation line. We, if, if we get close to that amount of money, we stop working. And we live simply, we set it up, you know, and, it, and, and, and nobody's happier than my, my kids and myself and my family. I mean, you know, we have a 1995 minivan, we own the house we live in, and uh, we make less than a certain amount. We pay plenty of taxes because, you know, we have school tax with the, with the house and sales tax when you want to buy clothes and when you want to buy water. And um, so that is a good one if you withhold the money from them because almost 50% of your taxes right now go to the military but once they start paying for the war in Iraq and start paying for the war in Afghanistan it'll be even more and um, the other is uh, how many people were arrested on Vestal Avenue? Nine. What if it was 900? When we did, when we took the streets in Ithaca after the election in, in 2004, um, we just walked in the street and it was busy and uh, it was like 5 o'clock at night and uh, no one was arrested. Uh, the police followed us around. They didn't even talk to us. And at one point, they put their car right in front of us and everybody went around them. The cop got out of there, everyone went around, nobody stopped. We just, you know what I mean? Had they had a permit, and you know, they, everybody would have been arrested. But you know, I mean, I, I don't know. But my my answer is in numbers. The more of us there are, the better chance we have to do it. I'd also suggest public education. I've been fighting against the Patriot Act since it was uh, passed, and one of the things I find really interesting is that when people actually understand what the Patriot Act allows the government to do when they understand that it allows the government to go into your house and not tell you or capture all your phone calls when they understand that the NSA powers the National Security Administration that they now have the power to take phone calls of everybody who's calling overseas when people actually understand the degree to which their privacy has been invaded then they get outraged on my car I have a bumper sticker that says if you're not outraged you're not paying attention and I would suggest to you that the majority of the American public is not paying attention and each one of you can help them understand the extent to which our civil liberties have been eroded and help them to pay attention because when the public does pay attention they start getting outraged and they start putting pressure on the elected officials to rein Bush in. Right now, there is pending in Congress bills to roll back the FBI's power to issue national security letters, which are like a subpoena that never goes in front of a judge. Most people don't have a clue about what those are. If we can educate people, get them paying attention, get them outraged, and then work grassroots to put the pressure on, that's one of the things that can be done. I'm not going to get arrested in CD at this time in my life. I probably will at some point in my life when I'm not working for the ACLU. So that's not what I do now. But public education is really important because most people just don't have a clue. And if you do, <coughs> then teach somebody so that they get outraged. It's a lot to be outraged about. Uh, d just two quick comments. One is that whenever the question is asked, I want to remind people is that dissent has been globalized. I mean, it really has, and it, 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 it would be a mistake to overlook the incredible amount of energy around social movements throughout the world that have been coordinated. Um, but secondly, I, and, and I have to make this personal admission, I know I've had a lot of debates with friends in this room here, I've conceded Washington. I'm done with it. I, I honestly, I've surrendered. I, and I think that many people should turn to grassroots and local communities as the way to where a different style of politics is going to, to, to emerge. Because we're talking about major shifts in social, political, economic systems. There is no way we could tinker with these systems over the next 40 years and, and be in a place that's sustainable and that's safe for our children and grandchildren. It can't happen. 
We're talking about major shifts, and that's going to happen in local communities. So more activists need to be involved in politics, I would say, and they need to be held accountable by a very large uh, uh, base, uh, a coalition of grassroots friends and neighbors. I have given a lot of uh, trainings, nonviolence trainings or civil disobedience trainings. Um, it's really helpful to share information that you have on, on tactics um, for actions. Um, and there's probably a lot of people in Binghamton who have had experience with different types of actions and um, maybe you should have a training or something um, which can sort of help um, have more. More people can come and more new ideas um, can be created there. Um, and it's, it's helpful for everybody to have those tools so they can share them with other people. Audience question. Although I understand your outrage regarding the Iraq war, don't you think you would be more effective and respected if you stayed within the law? I, I, I think at this point you have to respect all forms of dissent. I, I do not condone violence at all. I am a strong advocate of nonviolent civil disobedience and dissent. Uh, and in this instance, I think another of the reasons why, uh, just kind of touching on what you said, is that my stepbrother is an officer. In, in small communities, these are our friends, these are our neighbors, these are family members. It's not, it's not a clash between protesters and cops. That's just a false story. It truly is trying to get to this question about what is being done that's unjust, what is being done that's criminal and immoral. Um, so that was, had there been any discussion of the Iraq war prior to that protest? Little to none. It truly galvanized the community discussion about it. It brought together Veterans for Peace and uh, student associations. I think that was extremely valuable. There's a law in New York State, this is just one argument you could have in the courtroom, that uh, what is normally seen as illegal or a crime is not when it's done to prevent a greater harm. Like, you wouldn't go through a red light, would you? But if a fire truck's got its lights on and it's flying through a red light, you'd cheer it on. So maybe in that spirit. One thing about the protest. The, the protest on the BU campus was permitted. The protest on Vestal Parkway was not permitted and that was one source of the problem. The police overreacted, that's also clear to me. But what's not clear to me is that if the same gr group of people asked for a permit and wanted to go down Vestal Parkway, would the cops allow it and would they behave professionally? And at this point, based on what I saw in the videos and heard, I don't know that they would. I don't know that they wouldn't, but I don't have the same confidence that they would. And what I would love to see is a permit request to the Vestal Police Department for a protest in the same area and see what they would do because you do have a right to protest and to request a protest on a public street if you're going to be lawful. So if the police did overreact and the protesters didn't have a permit, let's test it. Let's plan very carefully another protest in the street, ask for a permit and challenge the cops to be professional about your rights and let's see what happens and you decide to do that, call me, I'll come back and I'll be an official protest observer. And that's in Vestal. And I guess I... I <laughs> well, now you are sounding like the mayor's office. <laughs> I'd just like to add one more thing because um, I guess it gets me fired up to hear, um, you know, well-respected or, or how, um, you know, the greater community use us and um, having been in war zones and really experienced what actual people have to go through living in those war zones, um, you know, having walking through the desert in Darfur um, because you're trying to escape from the Janjaweed and your three-year-old child dies of thirst along the way and um, being in Palestine where people's homes are 
demolished to make way for a new Israeli settlement and they're homeless suddenly and this has been their home for generations and um, things like that uh, knowing what's happening in Iraq sometimes doing something respectable is is sort of disgusting to me almost because what, it, what our idea in this country of respectable is, as Danny was saying, is insane. To, to continue with our lifestyle is killing the rest of the world. And so sometimes my outrage is so great that nonviolently <laughs> I need to make an enormous disruption because people are going throughout their day, and I do it too sometimes, but people are going throughout their day not realizing what they're doing is murder. And sometimes it's so much I have to explode. And, and sometimes I, I can't even imagine how people living through those situations don't end up being suicide bombers because my rage is so great just having been in those situations for a short time that you know, it's, it's hard to contain. So, so marching down the street, I mean, I have to applaud it because we need to be out there more often and we need to be letting everybody know that it's not okay. And, and we sort of have quieted down as a movement in the last couple of years, but we need to keep that rage lit. Okay, just a, one simple thought experiment. If you look back to 9-11, it's a tragic event about 4,000 people were killed from that event. Um, we, the world changed. We, wrote, we rewrote all the rules, right? And we, we went along with this from 4,000 people. I could speak to this because my best friend, childhood friend, was killed uh, also on September 11th. And we invaded a sovereign nation and imagine a thought experiment. If the same thing happened in the United States, imagine 50 million American refugees that's what our policies have done. 50 million American refugees and we changed the world order because 4,000 people died? I agree with it. There are times when respectful action and letter writing are just not the proper course. Audience question. I was arrested at a demonstration while attempting to stop police who were brutalizing a fellow demonstrator. How can I be expected to simply stand by and watch this happen? Each person has to decide what consequences they want to take on. I can tell you what my role is. My role is informing you what the law says and what it doesn't, where the lines are, so that you can make an informed choice. I don't like the word parade either. That's the word in the law. I'm not going to apologize for the law. I'm not going to defend it either. I'm just going to tell you what it is. But each person faced with torture or war or a cop beating somebody up has to decide what they want to do in that moment. I just want them to know the consequences of different choices. And I'm not going to tell you what the right choice is for you because I'm not you. For me, my choice is to be able to observe so that people have the ability to seek redress later and to effectively defend themselves in court later. And right now, at this time in my life, that's the role I've chosen. But I have to tell you, I live in the inner city in Syracuse. And if I saw a police officer beating somebody up or doing a strip search because they were African American, even knowing everything I know about the law, I would probably waltz in there and say, what the, the blank do you think you're doing? Stop it. And I'd probably get myself arrested. The law gives the cops the right to clamp down on a riot by being able to arrest anybody that interferes. So if you choose to interfere while your friend is getting beat up, um, then you are choosing to give the cop the justification for arresting you and using force. Now you also have to realize where you are. If your friend is African American and you're in an area where the cops can take him off to the booty room and do a body cavity search, then you may want to avoid getting arrested so that you can be far enough away to tell his family what happened. So you really, I can't tell you for every single circumstance, 
um, you may want to be the one that observes and records just so the person is safe. I mean, if I was in, if I was in Palestine and I was watching somebody's home be devastated or somebody being killed, I might step in front of the tank, but I might also be the one that wanted to witness to tell the world so that I could prevent it from being done to somebody else. And I can't tell you what to do in that situation. But there is value to observing and reporting, too. I guarantee you if, that you, did, if you did not do what you did, you would regret it the rest of your life. Audience question. Is it legal to photograph or videotape in a situation such as that? Only until the police officer gives you a direct order to cease and desist. So that's what happens, is you photograph the cop beating somebody up, and the cop says, put that away, go away, and you don't, then you're dissipating a direct order and you get arrested. So again, go four to six feet back and keep doing it. Then go four to six feet back and keep doing it. Audience question. Why do they have the right to tell you you can't photograph them? They don't have the right. They have the power to issue a direct order, <coughs> even if it violates your right, because the law gives them the powers that they need to be able to deal with a situation where people's life is in imminent danger. Professional police officers will not abuse that power. Non-professional police officers will abuse it right and left and sideways, and a police officer under stress, even though he may be a professional, may still abuse the power. And, and I'm pretty sure Binghamton has a SWAT team. Yes. And they practice for, uh, and Ithaca does, and um, they basically practice uh, crowd control and riot control because they're getting ready for us. <laughs> because there's no other reason for them to have it in, in Ithaca. I don't know what about Binghamton, but in Ithaca, uh, there's, we have a SWAT team because somebody mentally ill locks himself into a room and threatens to kill himself. So we train these guys to grapple. They do this. They, you know what I mean? And then I watch them handle them. They, they practice up by the hospital. And uh, so, like, we give the police this power. That's why they have the power, because we gave it to them. And a lot of these things that we let slipping away weren't... We didn't, again, I mean, I'm rehashing it. We made them not be able to spy on us. We made them not be able to just have these powers because they abused them in the past and now we gave them back to them because we've forgotten. And, um, you know, we're, your cell phone in your pocket, how many people have a cell phone? Do you know how that, that technology came about? Well, they took money, which they could have put into national health care, and they paid these, you know, the scientists at different uh, universities around the country to develop this software because they're sending people to the moon, you know, the, the, the moon, and all of a sudden you paid for that technology, but what did they do? They gave it to a corporation. And so you get ripped off left and right, we, get, we lose all these, we, you know what I mean, we lose all our, uh, I'm sort of way off the mark now with this thing, but... <laughs> That's another thing that pisses me off. I'll leave it. I would say that you did exactly the right thing. I mean, it's not illegal to talk to a cop. And so if you see someone being brutalized, then yes, I would say, go ask them what they're doing. Please stop it. But that doesn't mean they can't turn around and start brutalizing you at that point. And um, I mean, I guess that's where like all the different things come into play like you want to have a very peaceful demeanor and you know keep your hands down by your side and have a you know quiet voice but a lot of times that won't catch attention and a lot of times you're also really upset so you know they also might perceive you as a threat um, to give them the benefit of the doubt but um, then when you want to get into like more probably arrestable situations, you, there are also ways to protect people like puppy piles. Um, you know, if someone's being beaten, you can crouch on top of them and someone's supposed to crouch on top of you um, and things like that, but that's not as legal. The, the, again. Clo sorry, the closer you are when you're objecting or asking the question, the more threatened the cop is. So one of the things is to do it from a distance. But nothing in the Constitution prevents the cop from abusing his power. And how many times have you lied in bed early? Like, I should have said this. I should have said that. I should have done this. I, I can't believe I did that. I should have done that. But you did it. 
Now you don't have to go through that. And I did it. I was like, I know it's a it's St. Patrick's trial in Binghamton, and uh, and this guy's standing on the cane, and he's like this really wonderful guy. He's this uh, plowshares activist, and and he said, Danny, you know, you don't want to sit in jail because we knew we were probably going to go to jail. Just didn't know how long. You don't want to be sitting in jail thinking I should have said this to the judge because you're probably going to go to jail anyway, so you might as well. <laughs> and so the next day, I was given a contempt of court for quoting the Constitution of the United States on the stand. I, 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 I just have to, uh, this is just Tarek, the, you know, the citizen speaking here. Um, I think that the more trained you are, the, the less frequent that situation will occur. Uh, I also think that if you're going to protest or engage in dissent specifically against unjust policies uh, rooted in violence, I think you sit there and you watch. I really do. That's my personal belief. I think that when you look at the most successful nonviolent mov movements, it was people who trained and understood that they, may, that they may endure harm because they're giving voice to those voiceless who are enduring pain and suffering who can't be recognized. So personally, you would have to understand that these are consequences. And I think together, those who engage in that have to recognize that I'm not going to do anything. That's my belief. I don't think that you should continue or, or, or any, any way reify that that clash and that tension between cops and protesters. Yeah, but don't don't feel bad because you didn't have all the information. <laughs> but remember what happened f forever, and then that's how you change it. And the other thing is, like, next time you go in, have all this information that, that Grace and, ev and everybody's talking about here, and and do and, and and know what the actions are, and be able to read the crowd and read the police, and know what the police are expected to do, and how bad it can get, and the, and the, the nonviolence training, know what the uh, if you, if you do the action, what, what the probable charge will be, uh, and, and such, and and. and it, have your driver's license and like maybe five bucks on you and nothing else because if you have a watch, if you have a, a video camera and they arrest you, then you have to go back or it'll get lost. And you want to have one person holding your keys and one person you're going to call and you're going to have a phone number written on your arm who you're going to call up and you're going to know that if I go into, um, if I go uh, into the, the, go the, the recruiting center and I lie on the ground and do a that's going to be a violation trespass more likely. They could hit you with a criminal trespass, which reads exactly the same, but the only difference is it's got to be <laughs> surrounded by a fence or otherwise, uh, or, a mo or a wall or otherwise enclosed. If it's not, it's a, a violation trespass, and you're not rude to the cop, and you don't touch the cop, and you just say yes sir, no sir, or you don't say anything at all, and it's a violation, and that's 15 days in jail. If you do the jail time, it'll be nine days in jail with good time in New York State unless you act the fool, and then, and then you have to do the whole time, and the, 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 uh, the, the fine will be like 100 bucks, and if you refuse to pay the fine, that's the only time you do the jail time. And then if they give you a community service, you can say, fuck, you know, I'm not doing that. Danny's actually had surgically installed a whiteboard <laughs> on his uh, <laughs> forearm here. And, and the other one I think, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of really wonderful people who do this work. And they laugh and they have families. And the other thing they show on TV is the crazy shit, like they, these cops doing this, you know what I mean? But normally it's like, you know, awesome. like families. And you know, it's even Increased fun for me to observe system. because in my job, I can't do the kind of protesting that you guys do. But when I put on my protest observer hat and I'm doing my recording, I get to be there. And I get to enjoy it. So if, if I know that this is my role, I do it. If you know that you can't stand by, then make sure that you got somebody like me who can do the observing. So you've got both the intervention and the observing. You've got both roles. Planning. That's part of the affinity group idea. Audience question. Is there anything which prevents the police from arresting an official observer? No. Uh, there's, if I get in the way and the cop perceives I'm in the way, I could get arrested. It's not happened to me. I've been doing this for a while. But, yeah, I'm at risk, too. I, I have a tag that says NYCLU protecting a hat. It says protecting posters. So I have a tag that says an ACLU official observer. I have my pad. I've got something else here. They, and they know me. In, in the areas near where I, they know me. <laughs> oh yeah, it's the nut from the ACLU. Audience question. Is it legal to swear at a police officer? I, I don't believe it's illegal to swear at a cop, but I would not do it within six feet of the police officer. I would do it from a little bit further back 
there's no there's no bright line where you're safe here and you're not safe there because the cops have the power to use their discretion and the law and the courts give them very broad discretion audience question so do you think some of the protesters on the Vestal Parkway were arrested because the police believed them to be a threat it could have been that the cop was just pissed at him and he has the power to arrest them and then the legal system deals with it later and the law gives the possibility that they'll f be found not guilty or that the charges will be dismissed. My, my feeling is, um, it's only my personal feeling is, I yes sir and no sir them because they don't really mean shit. They're just cops. It's just their job. And whatever happens, you know, they're going to write stuff down and they don't, you know what I mean? They're going to lie. You can give them power by getting you know but you just say yes sir no sir and, and or just read your your statement you know what i mean but to, to swear at them even right. even when they're doing it because that's what they're doing they just want to get you you know you know what i mean you look at the civil rights movement man, the cops and those what? guys would sit and take it they were teenagers they were little kids you know they get sprayed with hoses and they stick their dogs on them and stuff that and and if you're in the right spiritual place and you're joyous and free and you and you're, do, you know, you're doing something like uh, larger than yourself, and you're, and doing something hopeful, and like, and and, and it's the base, you know what I mean? I don't know what religion everybody is in the action, but I guarantee you that you can identify with your religion with with the action uh, because they're all about peace, and um, you know, you don't need to go there with it. You know what I mean? You just, he's just another person, and you're going to respect him, and if he's in a bad mood and he's upset. Just understand that, and I, I, the best you can, because you're. A person. I just have to emphasize that is the more the more the more you see, you know, this cop image as integral to your actions or the consequences of the action, the further you are away from the original truth of you being there. I just, I mean, they're human beings. They are very well professionally trained police. They are poor, uh, poorly trained police. You're in a in a difficult situation. People make mistakes and errors. The more you assume them as this boogeyman, I, honestly, it's you. You're not truthful to what you're trying to do through your actions and I and I would I would ask others to like seriously question that I mean critically think about that because if you're trying to remove violent and unjust actions in the world for you to be subsumed by this figure of power is to it, it pulls you away from your truth it really does audience question but what if the police officer is overstepping the bounds of his legal authority I'm not, I'm not condoning that action, no, and, there should, and there should be mechanisms in, in place to hold all, all, all law officers accountable. And, and don't and buy into their there's culture. To pursue yeah, exactly. It's, it's more, uh, at that point, I see it as our job to defuse the situation, because they're making it about this violent thing. And what they're turning it into is what the cameras are going to catch. And if we want something else to be taken away from that protest, we've got to take the power away from them and by coming back at them with with yelling and whatever it might be just plays into that and um, sometimes it can be really hard and I lose my temper at them too but unless also unless the protest is about like police brutality or something usually the protest isn't directed at the cops we need to remember what our focus is and always stick to that because if you're trying to talk to the cameras you might not be but if you are you want your focus to be heard not fighting with the cops just yes sir no sir just remove all emotion anyway and stick to the culture of your group there is nothing that frustrates and confuses a police officer more than a leaderless group so don't give them a leader. Don't give them a command structure. Exactly. Stick to remaining silent or stick to the placard that says your thing. Um, but don't give them a command structure so that they feel comfortable. Stick with your group and they won't know what to do. And you'll have more time to protest because they don't have a leader to negotiate with. Stick to your culture of your group. Doesn't mean they won't hit you and spray you with pepper spray, but... True. But then you have stories to tell your kids. <laughs> The cops didn't know what to do. They were running around in circles because we didn't have a leader and they're a paramilitary group and they didn't know what to do without a leader. But they don't understand consensus. And if that's how you work, it frustrates them. And you get more time to get your message across.
And it's even more important not to lose your temper with the media. Yeah. They don't get pepper sprayed, but the whole thing goes out the window. I want to really thank uh, the Binghamton Political Initiative and especially the four panelists that we had and all of you for coming out. Thanks so much.